Hey everyone, Adam Simmons here from DGTL Infra, short for Digital Infrastructure. Colony Capital has been on an absolute tear in 2020, making new investments across all four sectors of digital infrastructure, including towers, data centers, fiber, and the combination of small cells and distributed antenna systems. In this video, I'm going to give you a quick overview of the expansion of Colony Capital across multiple geographies and segments of digital infrastructure, what companies have been acquired and created by Colony Capital over the past few years, and Colony's strategy to focus on the convergence of digital infrastructure, meaning that towers, data centers, fiber, small cells, and distributed antenna systems are all becoming more interrelated over time. You might actually be able to make some money off of Colony's digital infrastructure investment prowess because the company is publicly traded under the ticker CLNY. So stay tuned and I will break this all down for you. Before I do, be sure to subscribe to the DGTL Infra channel and turn on the notifications so you don't miss my next in-depth video that is coming out soon. Now, let's jump into the video. So Colony Capital is led by Mark Gansey, who became the company's new chief executive officer in July of 2020. Gansey is one of the most prolific investors in digital infrastructure, a guru of the wireless industry. But due to Colony's lack of history and brand awareness in the digital infrastructure sector prior to him joining, today Colony is less mentioned amongst investors focused on the digital infrastructure space, especially when compared to companies like American Tower, Crown Castle, Equinix, and Digital Realty. However, in 2020, Colony Capital is starting to become thought of as a true digital infrastructure stock to own, especially by institutional investors. Gansey has positioned Colony Capital to focus on the four key sectors of digital infrastructure, including towers, data centers, fiber, and the combination of small cells and distributed antenna systems. Colony is particularly poised to capitalize on secular themes such as the digital infrastructure behind 5G technology. As Gansey famously said, the dinner bill for 5G is coming, and it's expensive. So as we see on the page, it's important to understand the different sources of capital for which Colony Capital has at its disposal. The convergence of towers, data centers, fiber, small cells, and distributed antenna systems is becoming increasingly evident as Colony Capital is truly embracing this convergence strategy. Overall, Colony Capital has $21.6 billion of digital infrastructure assets under management, as you can see under the digital AUM line item on the left side of the page. And this represents 47% of the company's total assets under management of $45.7 billion, which you can see at the bottom of the left side of the page. As the table on the left side of the page shows, the remainder of Colony's assets besides digital consists of a lot of legacy real estate businesses, including healthcare, hospitality, and other equity and debt, which we'll get to further on in this video. So the main focus of this video are Colony's digital infrastructure investments, and they've been made with primarily third-party capital, as represented by the $21.0 billion number being the value of the digital infrastructure investments that Colony manages on behalf of its clients. Colony's clients are known as limited partners, or LPs, which made commitments to Colony's fund named Digital Colony Partners Fund 1 and includes institutions such as the Teacher Retirement System of Texas, which made a $200 million commitment, and Oregon State Treasury, which made a $150 million commitment. So Colony earns a management fee on these investments made with third-party capital, which we will discuss in further detail a little bit further on. Additionally, the $540 million that you see on the left side of the page are investments that have been made using Colony Capital's balance sheet. These include investments in data bank and Vantage data centers. Therefore, these investments have been made with what is known as primary capital, being Colony's own cash on its balance sheet. So instead of management fees, these investments contribute a portion of their earnings to Colony's overall earnings based on the percentage share which Colony owns in those respective companies. But given that the majority of Colony's assets under management sit under third-party capital investments, noted by the $21.0 billion number, it's worth breaking that down in a bit further detail, as you can see on the right side of the page. So on the right side of the page, we see Colony's Digital Infrastructure AUM, grouped by four categories, three which are particularly relevant. 
So first, Colony has $5.7 billion worth of investments, which include the likes of Zeo and Scala data centers, that have been made through Digital Colony Partners Fund 1. This is the company's $4.1 billion digital real estate and infrastructure-focused private equity fund. The second grouping of assets are $9.6 billion worth of investments, comprising six different companies, including Vertical Bridge and Extanet Systems, that were made through a company called Digital Bridge. And these are essentially separately capitalized companies that Mark Ganzi used to run at the firm Digital Bridge before it was acquired by Colony Capital and those investments and his team were brought on board. Finally, the third key number on the table on the right side of the page signifies Colony's large investments like Zeo and Databank, where Colony has syndicated a portion of the equity in these deals to co-investment or also known as sidecar capital, which in aggregate amounts to $5.7 billion of further AUM. So the distinction between which pocket of capital that Colony makes its investments from is important because the fee rates are different by capital source. For example, Digital Colony Partners 1 Fund charges a 1.2% management fee per annum on its investments. The separately capitalized portfolio companies, which is the former Digital Bridge portfolio, charges a blended 0.8% management fee per annum on its companies. And the co-investment sidecar capital has the lowest fee rate of only 0.5% management fee per annum on those investments. So now let's discuss some of the specific companies which Colony Capital has made investments in within the four sectors of digital infrastructure. So as we can see from this page, the total Colony Capital portfolio comprises 9,600 towers, over 95 data centers, more than 135,000 route miles of fiber, and more than 35,000 nodes for small cells and distributed antenna systems. So starting with the tower segment, let's walk through the different companies in which Colony owns. First is Vertical Bridge. Vertical Bridge is the largest private owner of towers in the United States, meaning that it is the largest tower company after the publicly traded tower companies American Tower, Crown Castle, and SBA Communications. Vertical Bridge is the number four tower player in the United States with more than 4,000 towers. That's about a market share of 2.6% of the total of 154,000 towers operating in the United States. Vertical Bridge's portfolio has a weighted average age for its towers of about 6.8 years and a weighted average contract duration that is more than 9 years, showing that very stable long-term contract that characterized tower companies. Moving to the next company called Digita, Digita operates 580 towers, all of which are located in Finland, which is in the Nordics. Digita also owns more than 600 miles of fiber and four data centers across Finland. Digita is the leading digital, terrestrial, television, and radio broadcasting tower company in Finland, meaning that the tower's customers are skewed more towards television and radio broadcasters as opposed to wireless carriers. Digital Colony committed approximately $300 million to the acquisition and future growth of Digita. Next is a company called Highline do Brasil. Highline has more than 300 towers built, all of which are located in Brazil, with a significant build to suit or BTS order backlog, meaning that it is more of a greenfield business plan for Colony as opposed to an established business. Highline also focuses on partnerships and exclusivity agreements with shopping malls, real estate owners, and hospitals to provide indoor connectivity. As a reference point, Highline's peers, American Tower, has 19,000 towers in Brazil, and SBA Communications has 10,000 towers in Brazil. Next is Andean Tower Partners, or ATP. Andean Tower Partners operates 2,900 towers in total with 1,000 towers located in Colombia, 875 towers in Peru, and 1,000 towers in Chile. Andean Tower Partners is the largest private tower operator in Peru, Chile, and Colombia. Andean Tower Partners is also more than just a tower company. It provides digital infrastructure services, including small cells, fiber, and distributed antenna solutions to its different customers. Again, as a comparison, 
Andean Tower Partners peer, American Tower, also operates in all three countries. And American Tower has 5,000 towers in Colombia, 2,900 towers in Chile, and 2,300 towers in Peru. Finally, wrapping up Colony's investments in the tower quadrant is Mexico Tower Partners, or MTP. Mexico Tower Partners is the largest private tower company in Mexico and operates 1,800 towers and 2,500 sites. It was created as a result of the merger of several different infrastructure companies in Mexico. And the company is dedicated to providing solutions to the major wireless carriers across Mexico. Again, comparing Mexico Tower Partners to its peer, American Tower, American Tower has 9,600 towers across Mexico. Moving to the right now in the data center quadrant, Colony has made four different investments in the data center space as well. Starting with Vantage Data Centers, in July 2020, Colony invested $185 million as part of a $1.2 billion Colony-led investment for an 80% equity stake in Vantage Data Center's portfolio of 12 North American stabilized hyperscale data centers. Colony owns 12.3% of the stabilized portfolio, implying a valuation for 100% of Vantage Data Centers of $1.5 billion. Colony went on to make further bolt-on acquisitions to Vantage Data Centers, and the company now operates as a whole in both the United States and Europe, operating 13 data centers representing 1,120 megawatts of power capacity in a number of markets in the United States and Europe, including 154 megawatts in Santa Clara, California, across two data centers, 146 megawatts in Ashburn, Virginia, 160 megawatts in Phoenix, Arizona, 70 megawatts in Quincy, Washington, 11 megawatts in Montreal, Canada, and 21 megawatts in Quebec City, Canada. In Europe, Vantage is operating facilities including 270 megawatts in Cardiff in the United Kingdom, 55 megawatts in Frankfurt, Germany, 40 megawatts in Zurich, Switzerland, 64 megawatts in Berlin, Germany, 64 megawatts in Milan, Italy, and 64 megawatts in Warsaw, Poland. Colony's next investment in the data center space on this page is a company called Aptum Technologies. Aptum was formerly known as Kojiko Pier 1 and rebranded as Aptum post-acquisition, as the company was carved out of Kojiko, which trades on the Toronto Stock Exchange under the ticker CGO. Aptum is a provider of co-location, network connectivity, and managed services in Canada and the United Kingdom, which Colony acquired for 720 million Canadian dollars, equivalent to about 550 million US dollars and this equated to an EBITDA multiple of nine times. Aptum is one of Canada's largest managed IT platforms, providing hybrid cloud services to enterprise customers. Aptum had over 2,000 miles of dense metro fiber across Toronto and Montreal, as well as 16 data centers in both North America and Europe. However, Aptum did separate its fiber assets from the company post-acquisition, which we'll touch on a bit later. Colony's next investment in the data center space is where the company has been quite active as of late, and that's a company called Databank. Databank currently operates 20 data centers, representing 54 megawatts of power capacity and about 460,000 square feet of data center space in the United States. In late September of this year, Databank announced the $1.4 billion acquisition of 44 data centers from Zcolo, which is a division of Zeo. And just as a side note, we made a video of that transaction going into detail about it earlier on, which I'll link to below. Once the Zcolo transaction closes, Databank will operate 64 data centers representing 138 megawatts of power capacity and 1.2 million square feet of data center space. Colony Capital originally invested in Databank in January 2020 purchasing a 20% stake in the company, valued at $185 million, which equated to 17.6 times EBITDA at the time. As part of the Zcolo transaction, Colony Capital is investing an additional 
$145 million from its balance sheet to maintain its 20% ownership in DataBank, which brings Colony Capital's total investment in DataBank to $330 million. Finally, Colony's fourth investment in the data center space is a company called Scala Data Centers. So in April 2020, Digital Colony launched Scala, a Latin American hyperscale data center platform, by acquiring data center assets from a company called UOL Diveo, an IT outsourcing company based in Brazil. Colony committed $410 million to the acquisition and future growth of Scala data centers. Scala is the second largest hyperscale data center provider in Brazil after Ascenti, which is owned by Digital Realty and Brookfield Infrastructure. Colony made this investment because Latin America is in the formative stages of cloud computing, with a lot of the cloud computing workloads historically residing in the United States. But cloud workloads are beginning to shift into the Latin America region, with Sao Paulo, Brazil being the key market. Other growing markets of Latin America include Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, Bogota in Colombia, Santiago in Chile, and Mexico City in Mexico, which are all experiencing increased workload activities as well. Colony expects leasing activity to be more pronounced in 2021 and 2022 as cloud providers look to shift some of their workloads down into the Latin American region. So that wraps up Colony's data center investments. Now let's move to the third quadrant, fiber. Fiber is the category where Colony has made the majority of its investments from an absolute dollar perspective. And that really revolves around the transaction of Zeo. So Zeo owns 133,000 fiber route miles and 13 million fiber strand miles, representing an average of 98 fibers per route, meaning it is dense fiber in terms of strand count. Zeo's fiber is also connected to 35,000 buildings in the United States and Europe. Colony, through its Digital Colony Partners One Fund, owns a material interest in Zeo, which was taken private in March 2020, alongside EQT Partners in a $14.3 billion transaction. $6.3 billion was invested of sponsor equity, and $8 billion of debt was raised. Colony Capital has additional influence over Zeo through its $2.2 billion of equity co-investment committed for Zeo as well. The next company in the fiber segment is a company called Beanfield Metro Connect. Beanfield is a bandwidth infrastructure provider serving carriers, enterprises, and multi-dwelling units throughout Canada. Beanfield owns and operates 220 route miles of dense metro fiber in Toronto and Montreal. From an overall perspective, the company has 47,200 fiber strand miles, which connect to 541 on-net locations. These locations include 367 commercial facilities, 161 multi-dwelling units, and 13 data centers. Colony committed equity of $100 million to the acquisition and future growth of Beanfield. Additionally, Colony carved out the fiber assets from another of its portfolio companies, Aptum, which we spoke about earlier, and moved them into Beanfield, which allowed Beanfield to increase its planned build-out to be 4,600 miles of fiber in Toronto and Montreal. So Beanfield is focused on that northeastern Canada region and the digital infrastructure vertical of fiber, with its specific offerings being in dark fiber, lit services, or enterprise fiber, and providing fiber to the home passings. Additionally, the company is beginning fiber to the tower and small cell initiatives. Finally, moving to the bottom and right side of the page, in the small cells and distributed antenna systems segment, we start with a company called Extanet Systems. Extanet operates 31,000 small cell nodes, 600 CRAN hubs, or cloud radio access network hubs, 4,000 owned fiber route miles, and 16,000 leased fiber route miles across the United States. In November 2015, Digital Bridge, now part of Colony Capital, Stone Peak Infrastructure Partners, Goldman Sachs, and Delta V Capital acquired Extanet for $1.4 billion from a consortium of Palomar Ventures, Quantum Strategic Partners, 
SBA Communications, which trades on the NASDAQ under the ticker SBAC, and Columbia Capital, amongst others. In mid-October of 2020, long-term institutional investor John Hancock Life Insurance led a consortium that acquired a 30% minority stake in Extinet as well. In terms of thinking about Extinet's operations, monthly leases range from $700 to $800 per tenant on terms of 10 to 15-year leases, so quite long-duration, secure income streams for Extinet. And in terms of the network construction cost, Carriers like Verizon, AT&T, and T-Mobile typically pay for 25% to 40% of the network construction costs, helping Extinet finance the build. And the final company we'll talk about is a company called Freshwave Group. Freshwave operates 4,000 small cell nodes and is the only independent provider of small cell infrastructure in the United Kingdom. Freshwave was built through a series of small acquisitions by Colony of different small cell and distributed antenna systems providers in the United Kingdom. First, Colony acquired Strato, a provider of distributed antenna systems and small cell networks focused on providing an infrastructure as a service model to all carriers across the United Kingdom. Next, Colony acquired OpenCell, which had over 2,000 live cells across 100 networks and worked with all four major carriers in the United Kingdom. Finally, Colony further enhanced its United Kingdom presence with the acquisition of iWireless Solutions, a leading small cell service provider with outdoor products and expertise, including outdoor connectivity solutions for the London Olympic Stadium and Twickenham Stadium. So Strato, OpenCell, and iWireless were collectively rebranded as Freshwave Group by Colony, to which Colony has committed more than $70 million of equity in aggregate. So as we can see from all of those investments in digital infrastructure companies, Colony Capital is clearly making a digital transformation. In the second quarter of 2020, Colony took $2.1 billion of impairments to bring the value of its assets mainly in real estate in line with fair value, given the company's desire for accelerated disposition of its legacy real estate assets and to shift its focus to its digital infrastructure transformation. So starting on the left side of the page, we're familiar with the digital segments of towers, data centers, fiber, and small cells and distributed antenna systems, which are on the top left side of the page. Colony Capital's six legacy segments include healthcare real estate, industrial real estate, hospitality real estate, colony credit real estate, other equity and debt, and investment management. So you can see that the top left side of the page links to the top right part of the page in terms of financial metrics. And you can see that the bottom left side of the page links to the middle of the right side of the page in terms of financial metrics. And so I'll provide a little bit more color now on those legacy segments, which we haven't touched on yet, which Colony is transforming away from. So first is healthcare real estate. This segment consists of 357 properties, including use types such as senior housing, medical office buildings, skilled nursing facilities, and hospitals. Healthcare has been an outperformer with collections remaining high, even though the sector has been under a lot of operational pressure. Colony believes that these assets will perform now and through the end of 2020 and through the COVID-19 period. So Colony is not seeking near-term asset sales in the healthcare segment, but could opportunistically sell the business if it received an appropriate offer. The second legacy segment is industrial real estate. Colony sold the industrial real estate business in 2019 for $5.7 billion to Blackstone. Therefore, you see it on the left side of the page as a legacy segment, but you don't see it on the right side of the page in terms of book value because it was closed and has been already sold. The next legacy segment is hospitality real estate. So on September 22nd, Colony sold hospitality portfolios consisting of 22,676 rooms across 197 hotel properties in the United States to a firm called Highgate. Highgate is a hotel-focused real estate private equity firm. The transaction value in this deal is $2.8 billion, 
which includes the purchase price of $67.5 million for all of the hospitality properties. In addition, Highgate is assuming $2.7 billion in consolidated investment level debt associated with the hospitality properties. The number to key off of here is the $67.5 million purchase price, which compares to the equity column on the right side of the page for the hospitality portfolio of $56 million. Colony is getting a little bit more than budgeted for the sale of its hospitality portfolio. The reason that the number is so small is because Colony significantly marked down the asset side of this portfolio, while the liabilities remained at $1.6 billion. Colony expects to close the sale of the hospitality portfolio in the first quarter of 2021. Therefore, this segment will remain on Colony's balance sheet for the next couple of quarters prior to closing. The next legacy segment is Colony Credit Real Estate, which trades on the New York Stock Exchange under the ticker CLNC. Colony Credit Real Estate is a credit real estate investment trust, or REIT, which is externally managed by Colony Capital with $4.7 billion in assets and $1.7 billion in book equity value, which is equivalent to $13.06 per share as of June 30th, 2020. And this compares to Colony Credit Real Estate's recent trading values of less than $6 per share, so it's trading at a significant discount to its book value. Colony Capital owns 48 million shares in Colony Credit Real Estate, equivalent to about 36% of the company. Additionally, a new chief executive officer, Michael Mazze, was installed in April 2020 to help stabilize the Colony Credit real estate business. And then finally, the Colony Credit real estate business also plans to grow this business with a new digital infrastructure debt focused strategy, so making loans to companies in the four digital infrastructure verticals. The next legacy segment here is what's called Other Equity and Debt. In Other Equity and Debt, Colony has harvested $340 million in year-to-date proceeds and expects to continue to generate significant capital from this business in the second half of 2020, given that Colony has a significant $2.4 billion of assets in this segment, as seen on the right side of the page. Other Equity and Debt includes instruments such as non-performing first mortgage loans, preferred equity, mezzanine loans, and real estate equity investments across a number of different sectors, including office, multifamily, hospitality, industrial, and oil and gas. Just to give you a sense of some of Colony's largest positions in the other equity and debt portfolio, these include non-performing first mortgage loans on office buildings in Ireland, preferred equity positions in multifamily properties across the southeast United States, and a real estate equity position in industrial assets across the United States. The final of the six legacy segments for Colony's real estate-focused businesses is what's called Other Investment Management. This is shown on the balance sheet as an asset for the value of the fee streams from management contracts for Colony's legacy real estate management businesses, the external management contract that it has with Colony Credit Real Estate, and management contracts with its North Star Healthcare Income product. Finally, the last line item that you see under the Legacy Businesses segment is what's called TRUPS, or Trust Preferred Securities. These Trust Preferred Securities represent a $280 million liability at a cost of 5.375% per annum. And this is basically junior subordinated debt from Colony's legacy North Star Realty finance acquisition. These trust preferred securities are non recourse to Colony Capital, but an obligation of the North Star subsidiary that owns healthcare, hospitality, and other non core assets. So, as you can see, after combining the top half of the right side of the page with the middle and bottom half of the right side of the page, Colony's total pro forma net book value as of the second quarter of 2020, was $2.5 billion. And after dividing that by the diluted share and operating partner unit count, the net book value per share for Colony is $3.73 per share. So one way to judge the value of Colony's stock price relative to its book value 
is to compare that $3.73 per share number to Colony's current stock trading price. And you'll be able to see whether the company is being valued at a discount or premium to book value as of Q2 2020. So we've discussed that Colony is pivoting to digital infrastructure, but it is also important to frame out the total addressable market in which Colony will be making investments into. This is important to size it against the amount of money that Colony is targeting to spend in digital infrastructure, which is about $2.5 billion per year in investment volume. So in 2020, customers will spend $378 billion of capital expenditures across towers, data centers, fiber, and small cells. Fiber will be the largest of those categories, with an estimated $200.5 billion of capital expenditures, including deployment of 39 million new fiber route miles. The new fiber route miles deployed is inclusive of metro route miles, subsea route miles, and fiber to the home passings. This fiber investment is important for things like dark fiber, which is a significant part of edge compute, long haul routes, which are specifically used by hyperscale customers and are providing strong returns for investors, and dark fiber connectivity to data centers, which is also being driven by those hyperscale customers. Next is towers, with an estimated $18.9 billion of capital expenditures, including building 87,000 new towers during the year. Next is small cells, where $3.2 billion of capital expenditures, including building 133,000 new small cell nodes, will be done in 2020. And this $3.2 billion number is a comparatively low investment going into small cells compared to the other sectors of digital infrastructure. But what this really emphasizes is that we are currently at the beginning of 5G, given that small cells are a key requirement for 5G buildouts, particularly for high band millimeter wave spectrum. Next is data centers, where an estimated $17.5 billion of capital expenditures is needed for an expected 1,400 megawatts of new hyperscale and co-location absorption during the year. And a significant portion of these capital expenditures are going towards the hyperscale facilities. Finally, other digital assets have a $1.2 billion estimate for capital expenditures, which is more of a catch-all. It's worth just re-emphasizing from this page that fiber is the largest component of capital expenditures because it is that connective tissue that binds all of the digital infrastructure together to make everything work, including data centers, towers, small cells, and fiber to the home. So everything revolves around these railroads of the future, which is fiber. So it's worth just wrapping up and showing how Colony's United States ecosystem of digital infrastructure companies compares to its peer group. So Colony makes the point here that it is differentiated from other digital infrastructure companies, whether they be private equity investors like Macquarie and Brookfield, or publicly traded digital infrastructure real estate investment trusts, also known as REITs, like American Tower and Crown Castle in the tower sector, or Equinix and Digital Realty in the data center sector. Colony believes the key differentiator between it and its peers is that Colony is the only provider that can deliver end-to-end -end digital infrastructure, meaning investing in all four segments in its core markets of the United States. So in the United States only, and this is why the numbers won't tie to what you previously saw, because it's not a global view, Colony's portfolio consists of 4,600 towers, 30,000 small cells, 135,000 route miles of enterprise and dark fiber, 45 co-location data centers, 19 edge data centers, and 9 hyperscale data centers. So Colony is the only real estate investment trust, or REIT, that allows investors to gain exposure across the entire digital infrastructure ecosystem. When compared to the other private equity firms and other publicly traded digital infrastructure real estate investment trusts, no other real estate investment trust can deliver the promise of the entire digital infrastructure ecosystem. So if we look at Macquarie, for example, they only have 2,400 towers, 65 small cells, 6 edge data centers, 
and four hyperscale data centers. And when we compare Colony to the bottom half of the page to some of the REITs, although companies like Crown Castle do offer solutions in towers, small cells, and enterprise and dark fiber, they lack the offerings on the data center side of the page, whereas the data center companies lack the towers and fiber, which Colony is able to provide a comprehensive solution for. So hopefully you found this video helpful. If you did, then please share it with somebody you think might also find it helpful. And consider subscribing to DGTL Infra and visit us at dgtlinfra.com for more of the latest news on digital infrastructure. Thank you for watching this video. Be sure to like the video and post in the comments telling me which investment by Colony Capital and Mark Gansey you are most excited to see grow over the next few years. As a note, Colony reports Q3 2020 earnings this coming Friday, November 6, and has a conference call at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, so we'll learn more about the company's progress at that time. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.